All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. This is Wei Chan from Cleveland. Today, we're very happy and honored to have Professor J.P. Hong from uh, Assam Medical Center, Korea, here with us. And uh, I'm sure J.P., everybody knows Professor Hong. Uh, uh, he really needs no introduction, but um, as your moderator, I'm gonna do my job. And I think you can all see my slide. Let's see, uh, oh, hang on a second. Okay, uh, so Professor Hong is a professor of plastic surgery at University of Alsun College of Medicine and the Sun Medical Center. And JP is world renowned in wound healing, diabetic foot reconstruction, and of course, microsurgery and super microsurgery. And he's done so many invited lectures, and uh, I think the actual number is hard to hard to calculate. In over 80 countries, he's done uh, visiting professorship in more than 40 institutions, more than 200 publications, and authored uh, 24 book chapters. And he received the prestigious Gadina Traveling Fellowship uh, awarded by ASRM in 2015. And since then, he has received a number of prestigious lectureship from Canada, from uh, Scandinavian, and the American Plastic Surgery Societies. And he has recently become the editor in chief of Archives of Plastic Surgery. So, uh, uh, JP has. Uh, uh, so many accomplishments, it's, it's really hard to go through them, uh, his impact to our field of reconstructive microsurgery. But I, I think for many of us, microsurgeons in the U.S., and myself included, were uh, his um, uh, concept of elevating thin flap along the superficial fascia is what has profoundly impacted uh, our practices, certainly has uh, in mind uh, particularly in uh, our practice when we face with so many uh, uh, patients who are heavy. And this technique really has revolutionized how we perform re approach reconstruction, and it has open, opened up new horizon. And when I visited JP, I was so impressed mm -hmm. with his passion uh, for what he does. And here you can see uh, JP had a little accident and still he insists on, on going to work and doing what he loves. And I think that day you still did two, two skip flops, uh, if I remember correctly, if not more. And of course, we all know that JP is not only a great mentor, a great friend, but also a great drinking buddy. He will definitely out drink you. And <laughs> Uh, of course, I need to give JP credit for um, our uh, limb vessel transfer flop. Uh, it could be based on skip, could be based on Tdap, and uh, this is we were inspired by JP's work and this JP's technique of superficial, superficial to superficial fascia harvest allows us to preserve the lymph node. All right, without further ado, uh, today JP is going to talk to us about how to be successful and uh, how to be, possibly how to be happy as well. Let's welcome Professor Hong. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Wei, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, the IMC members uh, of uh, re-inviting me to sort of talk about my short, relatively short journey uh, till now. I was asked uh, by Tommy, uh, you know, whether or not I could share some of um, my, my journey with you. And I guess 
a lot of the time, the question that I get asked is, you know, how do you become successful? And perhaps today, um, this would give me the opportunity to share, you know, what I think is success and what I, you know, what kind of mentality you need to have to be relatively successful. You know, as plastic surgeons, we all have talent. When you graduate, when you go to med school, that itself, because you're talented. And then through the training, we achieve our skills. And then finally, with that skills, we try to put it into use for the good of our patients. And ultimately, with that, hopefully achieve success. So today, I'd be like to talk to you about how do we become success. But first, I mean, do you know, I mean, have an idea on what your definition of success is? And if you do, do you really want to be successful? And if so, what do I need uh, to be successful? And in my mind, for me, I guess my, my definition of professional success was to help people, um, especially the patients who are neglected in some parts of plastic surgery. And I view that as my success. And I sort of ask myself, what do I need to do um, to do that? And as you know, with this really um, well-known saying that Rome wasn't built in a day, nobody builds their success overnight. It, it, plastic surgery, being a plastic surgeon, being a reconstructive microsurgeon is not a lottery. It's building by brick by brick as this Colosseum in Rome. So what are those bricks in our lives? And how do we ultimately create this beautiful Colosseum? And I guess it has a lot of um, things that you, you need to think about what your bricks really are. And like I said, everybody has talent. And with that talent, we start training. And with that training, with that effort, you ultimately build skills during that training. So I think the first brick that I want to talk about towards success is the training. A lot of the times we agonize through training. Training is not really fun. But after all, if you look back, and for those who are in training right now, it's about building experience. And not only that, it's about being efficient. It's being pragmatic in how you approach. And it's a lot of repetitions. You're doing ALTs over and over again and ultimately becoming persistent in being successful and having a, a successful flap. And with that, we ultimately try to reach perfection. And when we monitor flaps, you're even paranoid sometimes. Like Dr. Halleck says, what are the qualities of a good microsurgeon, as he said in the four Ps? So I really think the training is something that you really need to go through and, and build that first brick. Because without proper training, without proper experience, it's impossible to really improvise when you need to. As this um, case here um, and was um, also uh, made as a movie and was a case from Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell where, where the pilot had a failure of engine and, and somehow he didn't crash and was able to glide on the Hudson River like a miracle and ultimately save all the patients' lives. And this was only possible because he had tens and tens and thousands of hours of practicing, of experience, of, of flying. And when it came to improvise, he had that sudden notion and made a split second decision, saving all the people and ultimately reaching in that a new innovative way to land. So it's these routines during your training, even though it may seem boring, it may seem repetitive, and it's these routines. And ultimately, when you're good at routines, when you're persistent, and when you know what's going on, you basically have the foundation, the capability and the ability to sort of go out of that daily routine and start realizing, ah, maybe there's a different way. Maybe uh, there's a new way. Maybe I could do it better. And the training is actually building the capacity and the ability. And really, for me, what I tell my residents is that training is not only acquiring knowledge and skills, but it's ultimately building that attitude, that attitude that leads toward excellence. You're able to overcome boredom, 
persistence, you're looking for perfection. And you build that attitude of saying, oh, I could do it. I could do it. And like Colin Powell says, excellence is not an exception. It's from the attitude. So if you already have built that attitude through your training and feel that that four years, six years, or even eight years in some part of the world has made you understand what plastic surgery is about, then you're built the first foundation that will lead to um, future skills and future achievements. And with your talent, if you don't train, you'll never build those skills. So this is why training is so important. And as a sign of your training and your efforts and your persistence, you actually become a board certified plastic surgeon. And when you finish your training and when you become board certified, you're facing the world on your own. And now you have to ask the real questions. What do you want to do with your skills? And I asked myself at the end of my residency, what am I good at? And what do I love doing? What do I love to do? And it turns out that I was pretty good at microsurgery and I was, you know, I love to do extremity and, and chronic wounds, difficult wounds and do reconstruction. So with that, I chose to focus and really understand the depth of what reconstructive microsurgery is. And with that skill, you cannot be a general surgeon unless you choose to be a general plastic surgeon for the rest of your life. But if you decide to focus and dive deep, then you're creating something based on your ability. You're creating something that you'll find better ways to do, as Thomas Edison says. But without that depth, without that digging in and concentrating and focusing on that field, it's very difficult to find better ways because you need that practice and it's an extension of your training. And with that focus and depth and with your basic fundamental training, you will be able to see beyond the box. The ideas do not come all of a sudden. The ideas come with the basic knowledge and with the focus and depth of the knowledge that you want. But the reality is, you know, you're not easily doing new ideas because we all fear of failure. And because our training, we've been taught to do, you know, what works, it's really difficult to get out of that comfort zone and really start something brand new. As this Carton says, I mean, <clears throat> who wants to change? Everybody raises their hand, but I mean, who, who wants change? Everybody want, raises their hand, but who actually wants to change? It's very difficult. So how do ourselves, how do we actually change and get rid of that feeling of discomfort, anxiety, being lonely, and the fear of not knowing? How do we get rid of that? And it's difficult for us because of our fixed mindset. And I don't blame you. I blame the institution. I blame the, the, the way that we are taught in high school, in university, and some parts of the world, it's a little bit different than the other. But as medical students, I see that we're not really taught to challenge, you know, what we're, you know, what really works. We only learn what works. We don't, we, we don't, we, we're not taught to challenge the status quo. And then ultimately, just by doing what really works, we feel great. Because, you know, we feel like winners. And if somebody criticizes what I do, then we feel very offended. And ultimately, we're very closed-minded to actually go to the next level and try something different. And it's very unfortunate. Because a lot of the times, if you don't change, then you'll never go on to the next step. Challenge is a task where a task or a situation that tests somebody's ability. And you have to push your abilities because if you don't push your abilities, then you will not go to that next stage. And in our practice today, we see so many great innovations, face transplant and transplant, robotic microsurgery, robotic limb, super microsurgery, finding other diagnostic tools to work with, salvaging ischemic diabetic limb. It's great. And what these great achievements and these surgeons having in common is 
that they face the challenge and they come out with a new idea that really works. And that is what a growth mindset is all about. On the contrary to where we're taught, you got to break out of that shell and you got to find answers and believe that you can do it. And of course, it takes a long time. You persevere, like your training. We're already taught. And then you have the will to grow. And you accept that failure is part of our job, but you learn from it. And through this process, you get inspired and you become inspiring to others. And ultimately, having that growth mindset that leads to other innovations, as this book says by Carl Dweck. If you look back during your training or even now, I mean, you get great ideas. All of a sudden, it just jumps into your mind and say, oh, why did we do this? But how many of you actually took that idea and actually implement? Creativity, we're very creative, we're very talented. But remember, without doing, there is no change. There is no innovation. So I'd like to share what I think are the four steps of innovation and what this, how this helps to really set up a right mindset for you to change and for you to innovate. And some of you may have heard this in my past lecture. And I believe that the four steps are asking why, finding answers to that question. And then once you find the answers, you validate, you communicate, and you share your ideas, and finally putting it into action. Always have to ask why. I mean, a lot of times, you know, we debride uh, our wounds. But really, I mean, what's the evidence? I mean, if you look at the Cochrane Review, there is no really solid evidence. But you, you know, you just ask why. I mean, why is muscle flaps great? Why is why why can't we use other flaps? I mean, why do we do the way that we're taught? And you have to keep on asking and challenge the status quo because. If you look back, our mind was actually engineered to ask why. When you're a kid, or for those who have little children, you keep asking why. Sometimes it's a nuisance. Dad, why does the bird fly? You know, why does the stars shine so bright? Why are there so many stars? But somehow, during our training, during our education, we forgot to ask. And going back to that process of asking why and challenging the status quo, is the first step to change your mind. And you should not end there. You should do the research because the chances are a lot of people before you have asked the same question and have done the same research. And if you do your research, then you'll know whether this is a, a new idea where someone has really um, found an answer to this. And based on that, you could build your ideas and you could further your research. A lot of the times why, you know, colleagues in training ask the question and we get annoyed is because we know that they didn't do their due diligence in asking. If you do your due diligence to your question and then ask the part that you don't know, then that becomes a very good question. And you'll see any professor who you ask will be willing to answer the question as much as possible or even say, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do the research together. So asking why and doing the research really makes your hypothesis smart. And if there's no answer, then it's time to do research with animals, basic studies. And then when you have a small proof of concept, then this is when you need to be validated by your peers. And when I talk about peers, I sort of look back in my life and really feel grateful how I had such a great mentor who wanted to know my ideas, who wanted to find answers together. And along this journey, you meet many great mentors in your life and you cherish them for the rest of, their, rest of your life because they support you, they validate you, they provide constructive criticism. And in that process, they become part of your growth. And this is really important. And you not only meet them through training, but you also meet them through books. You also meet them through meetings. You also meet them through Zoom. And you take that opportunity to learn from them. 
and ask them to be part of your growth. And this is what mentorship and getting mentored is about. Because these people, these great surgeons, if they care, they will challenge you directly. And they'll become a very healthy critic to your research, to your questions, and through your journey. And that's what makes a better person out of you, out of me. And I was very fortunate to have these great mentors who are radically candid through my journey. If you don't have the luxury to find these kind of people around you, we live in a world of social media, Facebook, open access, web, YouTube. These are great ways to meet mentors. I get these kind of texts from people that I don't know, but I answer them and you'll be surprised how many surgeons are willing to ask, I mean, willing to answer your question and help you understand the process. So if you feel that you have a limited boundary in training, seek out. Go beyond the borders of your training. Go beyond the borders of your city, your country. Because ultimately the world can be your teacher only if you let it. So seek out. And finally, when you validate this idea, you have to put it into action. If you're not sure, do more animal studies. And then after you validate, then you finally have to do it. Always with you, what cannot be done. Hear you nothing that I say. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. This is probably one of my best scenes, one of the scenes that I like best from Star Wars. You must unlearn what you learn. And that might be true in some cases. And then Luke Skywalker says, okay, I'll give it a try. And it was, no, no, no. Do or do not. There is no try. And this is what innovation, this is what changing means. It's not trying to change. You do it. And that's what changing is all about. There is no try. You must do it. So my journey, after I got board certified, after I finished my fellowship with multiple great mentors, including Dr. Wei, my journey started in lower extremity with an ALT. I was one of the first to do perforator flaps in Korea. And as, as you know, ALT is a great flap. It really is a universal flap to many of the questions that we ask. But it is bulky. So I started to ask a lot of questions. I mean, you know, can I thin it? Is it reliable? I mean, are there other ways that we could thin? And I did the research and there are, and there are a lot of people who are interested in thinning. But ultimately I asked, I mean, what is the most safe, efficient way to do it? And did the animal studies and actually found out that there is a superficial fascia between the deep fat and the superficial fat. And we started to utilize this layer and ultimately started to elevate flaps on the superficial layer, which was really, was able to give me a thin flap while being very safe and efficient. And while we were doing this, we started to continue to explore and ask the next question. Oh my God, this donor site is good, but can it be better? And started to explore the groin and then ultimately learn about the skip flap from Dr. Fukushima. And then with some of the disadvantages that I saw, was able to modify and ask questions. How can I, how can I minimize lymphoria? And then start to explore the superficial fascia and the skip and ultimately really able to elevate a very thin flap with a great donor site. And in this process, while I was doing a lot of perforator flap elevation, these small branches from the perforator were a huge nuisance, especially if you're doing a intramuscular dissection. I had to go from dissection to bipolar to monopolar. And I asked, what is the most efficient way to do it? Why not just do it with a monopolar bobby? And we were all taught that monopolar bobby is just doesn't work because the radiation of the heat is so great that you're going to burn all the vessels. And I actually tried to find, I did the research, and, and the funny thing was there was no really good comparison between a monopolar and a bipolar. 
So we actually did a research model and looked in the animal and we actually measured the radiation of the heat coming out. And you know what? It turns out that there was not really much difference between the bipolar and the monopolar from the cutting mode. When the cutting mode is high enough, it actually coagulates these microvessels as well. So we were able to find this. And then we actually even did a little bit further study with the electron microscope. And we actually saw that the bipolar, when it's more closer uh, near the uh, per perivascular structures, it actually causes more damage than the monopolar on a cutting mode. So we actually took this with confidence and started doing our elevations using a monopolar cutting mode. And as you can see here, we're very close to the perforator. And then we're able to ligate simultaneously while cutting and then ligate and coagulate the small branches going to the muscle. And look how fast it is. There's no bleeding, period. And we don't have to go back and forth. So these are the questions when you keep asking and you do the research and you become confident, you validate your idea and you ultimately do it. And then you realize that maybe this is a better way. And then as we're doing a lot of lower extremity, you know, what is the evidence of dangling? I mean, dangling it itself is to sort of acclimate the flap to swell to accommodate the swelling when the leg is lowered. So why not physically compress the flap so it couldn't swell? So that was the, our idea of early compression. And it turns out that it worked pretty well. And as we're doing a lot of skip flap, a lot of the times the puff rays are very short. So how can we overcome that? That's our next question. And it really led us to utilizing the puff rater as the recipient vessel. So, and now we're able to do perforator to perforator for a lot of our reconstruction. And as we're doing perforator to perforator, it was really difficult to see a crisp capillary refill because the inflow was a lot of times was almost as equal as a perforator inflow. So we actually tried to find another way to monitor um, these flow, uh, the condition of the flap objectively and came across using a lot of ultrasound. And now we're using ultrasound for the preoperative imaging to intraop and now to post-op and make sure that we have a good flow going into the flap. And we, and we further toyed with this in propeller flaps as well. Did you know that when you rotate one propeller 180 degrees compared to the other dissection, direction 180 degrees, did you know that they had statistically different um, velocities going into the flap? So what does this mean? It means that when you take a large flap, then you want to rotate to the side of the best flow. So it will minimize the flap complication in regards to flap survival. So we are able to understand this and then also share it with you. And this is the result of keep asking questions. And as we were doing this, we came across this ultra high frequency that was introduced by us by Aki from uh from japan and then we started toying with this and it gave us more better resolution and on and made us understand the per the the, the role of the puff raters especially in ischemic diabetic foot and now we're able to find these small collaterals in ischemic diabetic foot and use that as a recipient to salvage ischemic diabetic foot and the journey continues it is exciting and now we're doing cyborg bionic limb uh, we're doing uh, functional lymphovenous anastomosis in stage three using these kind of ultrasound to actually map out functioning of lymphatics. And the journey continues. And this all starts by asking why and doing the research, validating your ideas, and ultimately building that confidence to do it. And that, I believe, is the right mindset. And as you can see, this is not just a one-time thing. It becomes over, over, over again. Every time I'm facing challenge, I keep on asking. And when these change starts to repeat, it's not that painful anymore. When you start running for the first time, but when you run for like three months, then the pain goes away. And then if you don't run, then you feel that, you know, you have not done your daily routine and ultimately gives you a big present of better health. And that's what change could do. 
if change becomes lasting, keep on asking, keep on asking, it becomes a habit. And habit will change and make your behavior, the mindset that you need, and ultimately give you that character, that character that you'll continuously find new ways to solve problems. This is not a one-time thing. Passion is a consistency of goals held over a long period of time. It's not single intensity. It's not a single enthusiasm. You keep on pushing. And in this process, you persevere. Yes, there are failures, but you overcome. And once you have that fundamental skills from your training, and then you keep on pushing yourselves, changing the mindset, and building a habit of efforts, that becomes an achievement. An achievement to help your patients, an achievement that you share with your colleagues. But there's a downside to this. You know, we all face some type of failure, especially if you're a reconstructive microsurgeon. And you have to accept failure because failure is part of our job. The real failure is when you give up, when you give up something you love doing. That's what real failure is about. And failure, people say, is a mother of success. Why? Because it makes you humble. It gives you the opportunity to learn. It gives you that feeling of overcoming and next time leading to success, ultimately improving and evolving. And most of all, you grow from this experience and you keep moving on despite failure. You keep moving on and keep pushing yourself. I always tell my residents, there are two things. You could categorize anything in your life into two things. The things that you could change with your effort and the things you can't. Guys, what can you do? The flap's dead. You manage, you take it on, you do another flap or you, you somehow manage and then you move on. You focus on the things that you can change. Things you can't, just forget about it. Don't waste your time. That's the way to be efficient. Success is never final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue, that counts as Winston Churchill said. And in this process, don't make that journey alone. Build a team, build an environment around you who you can share your ideas, who will be a, a frank, candid critic to your ideas, to your approach, and be there for you when you fail and share that success, share that happiness with you out for a drink build that healthy environment because with this it just makes your life much easier and you're able to look back tough times don't last remember it's the people who does during tough time and as you're progressing one day you'll take on the role of being a leader and when that opportunity comes and people ask you to step up to be a leader, that is the time that you take that opportunity to build an environment, a healthy environment that allows people who wants to change, who wants to have the right mindset, who wants to grow, who wants to have similar dreams, similar success in life. Take that leadership to help others grow and be part of their journey as others have been part of yours and don't despair if you didn't go through that journey when the opportunity come then make that change make that change and change that environment into an environment of success change leading to success begins and it ends all with you and when you have that opportunity take it when you have that leadership take it build that environment that allows you to change. Through this journey, you must believe, as Dr. Kushima said when I visited him, and a lot of you know the story, 
I think it was uh, early 2000 when I was trying to learn about lymphedema. And I went to go visit Dr. Koshima. And he said, JP, this is, you know, this is a lymphatic vessel. And I said, where? This like slimsy, flimsy fiber. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So I really can't see anything. And he goes, okay, maybe you should come to the surgeon's scope side. So I went to the surgeon's side of the scope. And I started looking. He goes, you see it now? And I said, oh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. He goes, JP, just believe this is lymphatics. And if I hadn't believed that's lymphatics, if I hadn't believed that I'll be able to do LVA someday, then I may have never had the courage, build the confidence to do super microsurgery. So you have to believe. Most of all, believe in yourself. Believe in your past. Believe in your training. Believe that you have that fundamental ability and, and build and, and, and dive in, focus. And then you'll be able to believe that you could find the solution for these problems that you're facing. And believe that tomorrow you always find a better way. And through this process, believe that the opportunity will come upon you. This is a case of diabetic foot. And, and when, and when um, I tell my colleagues during my early days of faculty, he goes, hey, what are you doing? I say, oh, I'm, I'm, I want to major in diabetic foot. They all look at me as if, as if I'm crazy. You love smelling that stinky feet, squeezing pus out of the wounds. I mean, why do you want to do this? Because nobody else was doing it. And I was good at doing the wound management. I was good at doing reconstruction for these ischemic diabetic foot or infected diabetic feet. And you know what? Not a lot of people were doing that. And even though it seemed so dirty, all the hard work that I went through the learning, the reading from Dr. Adinger, Dr. Hallock, pioneers in diabetic foot reconstructions. I had the opportunity to add my part of the solution to so that other colleagues could help these kind of diabetic foot patients. It's hard work, and then you'll find opportunity. Opportunities don't, don't just come by. You have to have the ability to recognize them. And further down the line, you have to have the ability to create them. It's all from hard work. And these hard work, believe me, will pay off and will give you the opportunities. And when that come, jump on it. Take that opportunities. A lot of times when you face to change when you face the challenge it's a lonely process and this is why the team really helps but nevertheless whether you're alone whether you're with a team whether you fail or whether you success in a flap feel grateful feel grateful of the past that you had of the training that you had of the mentors you met of the learning experience you had Feel grateful of the present that you're able to see patients and fe feel grateful of the future that will come upon you and smile upon you with all the hard work that you're doing. Staying positive, supporting the people around you, accepting reality, and thinking of the next step. And in this process, you'll be you'll learn how great life you have. And life is short. Life is short to blame. Life is short to be pessimistic. Life is short to think about bad things. Live it. Enjoy it. And most of all, through this journey, don't forget to have the fun. Fun is an essential part of your life. Go out, know your peers, go have a drink with them. Go, go, go have a, you know, I mean, if you sometimes get angry at the residents, you know, go listen to their story. What's wrong? How can I help you more? You know, go mountain climbing together, go marathons together. Get to know them, not only professionally, but get to know them personally. Professionalism is about having a good 
working environment with your team. And that aspect of per personal knowing, personal friendship, really ultimately helps you and your team to build the right chemistry for your success. As Confucius says, if you choose a job you love, you'll never feel like you're working a day in your life. And frankly, when I get up in the morning, I'm excited to come. I'm excited to see my patients. Of course, I'm not excited every day when you have complications. But most of the days, I'm excited. I'm excited uh, to know what's ahead today and to know that I'll be helping the patients. I'll be helping my peers around me. I'll be helping my residents, my, my trainees through their journey. And what more is there to ask? I think the key steps to being successful is training hard. And once you have that ability, that fundamental ability, building the right mindset, and building that into a habit, accepting and learning from failure, creating the right environment, believing in yourself, being thankful, and of course, having fun. And that I think, that is what success is all about. You have the talent, you build the skill, you achieve, and with your achievements, you know that you have had and will have a very successful career. Everything else follows. So going to the question, if I look back at my short journey till now, I think it's the process. It's the process of aiming toward that perfection. It's the process of persevering. It's the process of failing and learning. It's the process of meeting people, learning from people, mentoring. And it's that journey itself that is so exciting and that is so fun. When I get a call from my resident who finished the training and they say, oh, you know, Dr. Hong, you know, I did my first flap on my own and it looks great. Thank you. What is there more to ask? If that's not happiness, I don't know what is. So enjoy your journey today. Don't regret. Carpe diem. Enjoy it to the fullest. Make that journey. Make that journey towards success based on your hardship, based on your effort. And look back. And then you'll realize that you're already happy in this earth. And what's really rewarding is that the journey doesn't stop there. The journey continues. And you ultimately understand when you're at the happiest moment. And for me, I guess it's to really help people grow and knowing that I did something and been part of that journey for their during their growth. I think that's the ultimate purpose of the journey I'm taking now. So with that, Thank you very much. And I hope to answer any of your questions. So thank you for listening to part of my short uh, journey till now. Thank you, Tommy. And thank you, Wei, uh, for moderating this session. Thank you.